So this is what we decided on doing. We decided that we were going to set up a studio, as an architecture studio, which linked to the neuroscience labs at Caltech. So we were going to put together knowledge of the brain and the way they were operating to find that kind of knowledge and the way you do an architecture studio, which is you work night and day with a team of about 25 people, all of whom are doing different things and have no idea what they're doing, professors who are pushing them to get it done twice as fast as they really know how to do it, and put these two things together. Because we figured that even the physical setup would help this sort of amalgamation. The second aspect, and boy did I pay for this one, was the use of the charrette to do evaluation. Those of you that know design and architecture know exactly what this is. You take a very short period of time and you do all the, all the phases of a project. You lay it out, you do the prototyping, you figure out where you want to take the thing, and you can do it anywhere from two hours to two or three days. So a charrette is a very intense design application exercise. The third and one that I did in collaboration with a couple of the biologists there was the use of metaphor as the prototyping system. Now, here's the thing about metaphor, and it's the thing that I've been doing my research in, and people like John Allman are doing research at Caltech. The the idea of metaphor is to create a situation where one thing or one concept or one word is identical to another one that it isn't. The most famous two are man is a wolf, and the second one is Juliet is the sun. In both of them, you have a gigantic database about one thing. You have a gigantic database about another thing, which are antithetical, and you mingle them. You put them together. The brain can do it in milliseconds. So. We used metaphor as a way to generate the initial concepts and then the follow through on a series of proto projects helping each of the students to understand how to collaborate together because both the scientists and the designers were in on it together. And then we turned them over to the VC people who showed them how to do a business plan and we did a business plan through the charrette method as well. So here's how we started off this project together. We had about, by that time, about 15 students uh, we had projects like a, a, a 3D bubble generating system so you could do letters and forms in space by doing inkjet technology on a three-dimensional level. We had a, several others that I'll mention. And here's our first uh, project. We met with them on a Friday afternoon after we'd selected everybody. And we told them, you have until Monday to produce a prototype and a business plan for a hydrogen-driven bicycle. Go. We knew that during the holiday, they weren't going to be able to contact many people to cheat on, so it was really going to be up to their own imaginations. Well, we had an incredible set of projects. I'll just tell you one that's kind of interesting, because they said, well, what do you mean by hydrogen-powered bicycle? Where can we take that? And we said, anywhere your imagination will allow you to. So on Monday, we saw a bunch of students pull up a truck, take off a mysterious package, much bigger than I am, and roll it into the presentation area, which is like this. And just when their uh, time came up, they stripped it off, and there was a Coke machine, but it had been reformatted. You put a quarter in, and you got out a can of hydrogen. <laughs> That's the kind of thing that happens when you put a designer together with a bunch of scientists. You get these kinds of completely new and fresh ideas. So this entrepreneurial problem, uh, program is actually still going. It's very successful. Several of them who are my students, I had the grad program in industrial design, which I'd started up, and which I used mainly the neuroscience of Caltech to train my students, uh, now have uh, animation studios and everything like that. It really sort of formed them. So the question is, what was the biggest problem, aside from the normal problems of not having a common language? And the biggest problem was writing that business plan. It wasn't getting the economics and the, and the finance. The kids understood that pretty well, or they could be taught that. But by the end of the day, 
formulating a business plan is the thing that they found the most difficult, whether it was a charrette or not. So that's something to think about. It's the way you abstract the thing you want to make into the capitalist financing system. It ain't easy. It isn't even always obvious. There's as much intuition and creativity to that process as to any of the other ones. So um, what else was I? There's a million things. I, I thought originally that I had a half an hour, and it sort of got, it sort of got trimmed down. But um, the basic thing that, that, that we learned was that the language problem came up right away, and by using metaphor, and by using the VC capital guys, we produced behavior that became common. By processing the charrettes together, by setting and, and choosing their own goals and their own projects, it was the way they acted, whether they could talk about it properly or not, that was really important. And the second thing was goals. And since the goal was to produce a business plan for a viable company, everybody had to relate to that. So when you think about these things, particularly with this biomimicry, which is just, just tingling with uh, possibilities that are offered to the design community as well as new kinds of science, this idea of having the people work together and that the teams sort of come up with their own ideas of what they want to make and how they want to go about it. So it's important that the team, this combination, set goals and set process for themselves because there they'll sort out how they're actually going to assign roles to one another and out of that will come a language for their project. And it's very, very effective because they start to communicate. So uh, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Michael, please. You make it sound so very simple. Oh, it's like falling off a log. Yeah. <laughs> it's sometimes the most complicated, isn't it? Yes. I think, the, the, it, as usual in these things, you have to find something more than talk. Mm. You know, that people, people sort of defend their terrain when it comes to talk. But this little thing that I'm going to do afterward, which is the little exercise, I'm going to try, and we have a lot of these packing peanuts and things, is I would give these little projects where I would, I would come up with a metaphor of, a, of something to make, and then I would give the students like a minute to make it. And the design students sort of got it right away, but after the scientists realized that they didn't have to think it through, that you let this sort of thing, which I call haptic, the ability to do haptic metaphor. It's because directed to your hands, not passing the brain. Right. Well, you don't try to put it into language. You process the incoming language, but your brain can haptically process things because you have the evolutionary part of the brain that was there 250,000 years before we could speak. We were already making objects that weren't the things they were. They were little so fetish curious, objects and they were arrows. How on earth will this work? So we can try it during the coffee break. So I will explain a little bit slower than you just did. This is it. We have five...